many of you already know me, I was FSFE's president for six years, from 2009 to 2015. About a year ago, I handed over this job to Matthias Kirchner and uh, Jonas Oberg, who have been performing splendidly ever since, and I happily moved on to uh, Siemens, where I now work at the corporate open source governance team. And um, what that means in practice is something I'll, you'll discover during this talk. So what I'm here to talk about is why free software is so important for Siemens and um, share some things that Siemens is doing in free software. But the main, my actual reason for being here is just to deliver the message that uh, Siemens is active in free software and Siemens wants, really, really wants to be a good citizen in the free software community. Um, and we just should talk more, okay? Uh, good. Oh, no, 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 no. Before I get going, I'd just like to congratulate FSFE on their 15th anniversary this year. So thanks to all of you in this room who helped make that possible. All right, now, a very quick primer on the company. I'm not going to bore you with stock market presentations. Um, Siemens is, in pretty much every respect, the opposite of a startup. Siemens was founded here in, 18, here in Berlin in 1847. At the time, this was the Kingdom of Prussia. Um, and it will, the company will be celebrating 170 years of existence next year. It does a lot, lot of things uh, in infrastructure, in factory, maybe in building factories, in, in enabling industry. Most of our customers are utilities, in the other industrial companies, and... Um, well, the, the public sector where it comes to infrastructure. Uh, the company's activities, which I'm not going to go into in detail here, because uh, you can read that elsewhere, fall under three main headings. Electrification, building power plants, uh, financing power plants, building electricity grids, building wind farms, and so forth. Um, automation, designing and building factories and the machines that go in them. And digitalization, which means doing interesting stuff with all the data, that arises from, uh, from these other two activities and interpreting that, that and offering it as a service to our customers, not hoovering up all the data in the world like some other companies are doing, but the aim is to, when you're running a factory, um, you have all these machines with, the sens with sensors that increasingly gather huge amounts of data um, and Siemens could be adding value for our customers by letting them know when their machines are about to break down, need replacement or need service and so forth, that kind of thing. Um, of course, digitalization, which is all the rage at the company these days, requires software. And this is where free software comes into the picture. We've been using this slide internally, a lot of colleagues made it, um, to explain to our managers why Siemens needs free software and why they should just let their developers get on with the job in this regard. Up to 2000, you'd have the typical Siemens product would fit in a box of varying sizes maybe building size, but still a box, um, where would, you'd have a proprie proprietary Siemens application running on top of a proprietary operating system. And overall, there wasn't a lot of software in these things. Um, over the past 15 years, we moved to a scenario where the, uh, the proprietary, Siemens, proprietary Siemens application would still be there, but it would run on top of a commodity operating system. That could be something like Windows in whatever version, could be Linux, mostly Linux kernel or BusyBox on top because a lot of this is embedded stuff, um, or something else. But now it's gotten really, but it, already you see the pyramid growing. There's more software here, right? Um, and now we're finally at a stage where um, the device no longer is, or the, the product no longer is a box. Siemens makes half its revenue from services. And uh, the physical product that we sell very often is just the centerpiece, the anchor point for um, a, a service offering that goes around it. So you might sell a device that uh, controls an assembly line, and then that device will gather data, send it to a cloud service for analysis. Um, the, the results of that analysis will get sent to the factory manager, to the factory floor manager, so they know what's happening on the assembly line. And all this will be held together with middleware and uh, Siemens-specific frameworks. And on top, there's a proprietary Siemens application. Now, the reason the customer buys this product is here at the top. 
Do they pay for a nicer cloud service? No, they don't. Do they pay for a link to mobile devices? No, it would, like pay, be, it would be like paying extra for a steering wheel in a car. If someone asked you to do that when you buy a car, pay extra for the steering wheel, you'd go like, no. <laughs> you'd be right. So what this means for Siemens is if we want to be competitive and if we want to be profitable, we have to invest our development effort here. Not here, not there, not there, not there. Um, all this, because all, this does nothing to distinguish us from the competition. We can't run, and, or we, we're not interested in running a nicer cloud service than uh, Amazon or Microsoft, because we'll, when we need those, we'll just buy them, like the, the service, not the company. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, so, and again, we need lots of software, and that software has to come from somewhere. On the other hand, the number of developers over all this time is more or less constant. We're now at seven, roughly 17,500 software developers in Siemens, a company that has 340,000 employees in most countries in the world somewhere. And um, it's not a huge number, and we can't hire another 50,000 or something to write whatever software they need. It's just not, it's just not possible. You can pay for it. Um, so free software is the only option, really. It's what everybody, because our competition knows this just as well as we do. Um, and if we were to somehow insist on licensing all our stuff from proprietary vendors, we would just be burning money. It's... So um, this means that free software is already very widely used uh, in many Siemens products. Um, instead of going through the entire portfolio, I'd just like to point out a couple of things. One is rail automation and vehicle control systems. Yes? Uh, will slides be available after your talk? They will be available, yes. Um, so rail automation and vehicle control systems, meaning the software that makes sure that your high-speed train, when it goes 300 kilometers an hour, stays on the rail and stops at the right time. Um, at FSFE, I often got the question, well, well, free software is all well and good, but what about safety-critical systems? Can you use it there? And the answer is yes. So the, the, the vehicle control system in some of the ICE trains um, uses Linux and the Linux kernel and many other things. Um, the, when you develop safety critical systems like that, or when you try to get them to market, you need to run through a testing process. And the one, one of the requirements is that software be developed in a certain way through a certain process. And the Linux kernel very much does not fit that process. This turns out not to be a problem because the testing, the testing authorities are actually quite flexible. If you find some ways to convince them that your system is safe, then, um, then they will accept that. And that's what happened here. And the engineers tell me it was totally worth the effort because uh, all the alternatives they had were more expensive, slower, and not as good. Um, the other point I wanted to highlight is medical imaging, um, healthcare, and especially MRI scanners, ma magnetic resonance imaging scanners. Um, because these are medical devices, they go through an extensive certification process in both Europe and North America and lots of other countries too. Um, and again, they've been using Linux since 2003 or so as a kernel. Uh, there, so it's perfectly possible to do that um, in environments where you need extensive certification. Of course, whenever you produce a device that needs extensive certification and you want to market it, there's a certain amount of paperwork that comes with it, and there's no way around that. But um, it doesn't get worse when you use free software in the device. Sticking with the MRI scanner as, as, as one of the examples of how free software is making Siemens faster and more efficient, um, the product people started using Linux in the scanner because they needed an operating system that could do real time, so that could deliver, that they needed to build a system that could respond to system events within a specified number of milli or microseconds. Uh, not every software can do that, of course. And um, they needed software, an operating system that was always up to date with the latest real time technology, and only the Linux kernel could do that. And so they started using it out of necessity. Um, but then they started very soon started to love it because they said, well, it's extremely flexible. We need something where they can accommodate it overnight, meaning they meaning that some Siemens engineer would sit down and write the code and it would then uh, get contributed to the kernel where it ha lives happily ever after. 
Uh, some other examples, and these are mostly business focused, right? I'm not talking about technical stuff here mostly. Um, this is, I'm using most of these slides internally as well when I'm talking to our management on why they should be using more free software, contributing more to free software. And my real purpose here is to give all of you these arguments so you can go to your own managers or audiences or whatever and um, convince them. So one product, a control panel for building automation, lets you control heating, access, lighting, and so forth. Um, the software stack is mostly free software, 90%. Uh, only 10%, mostly the user interface, is uh, Siemens proprietary. Now, the development effort, on the other hand, 90% of the development effort that went into this product went into the proprietary part. 10% went into the free software part, which means that this was a very efficient allocation of Siemens development resources, which is a good point to make for managers. Um, the, the ten, the, of the 10% that were invested in the, adapting the free software parts, these adaptations actually mostly got pushed back to the project mainline because uh, the people doing this development work, they are, of course, developers. They hate repeating work that when it's not necessary. So they just push it upstream and hope to always find the code in later versions of, uh, of the project. Um, example that I really like is um, a certain CNC automation device. CNC uh, basically means milling, cutting. Um, you take a big block of steel, put it in a machine, and you, at the end you have to get a cylinder block for a car motor or for a car engine or something. It just cuts away and removes material in different ways controlled by a computer. Um, it's one of the Siemens bread and butter products. Um, has so far brought revenue of more than 20 billion euros over its lifetime, 15, 20 years. Contains a lot of third-party components. Uh, most of these are free software. One of them is one of those is the bootloader. Uh, that is core boot. The device used to run with the UEFI bootloader, and that would take eight seconds to start up the device, which isn't terribly long, but uh, can feel very long when you're trying to bring up your assembly line back to production after a power outage. So now it, it takes two seconds instead, because the developers decided to use core boot, and they also contribute their patches on, and their, their uh, additions to the main core boot project under the GPL simply because they hate doing repeat work and this is the best way to do it. And again, nobody buys this thing because of the bootloader. Most customers don't know what a bootloader is. <laughs> There's no business case against using free software here, but there is a very good one for using it. And finally, um, here, the, a control system for power generation. One of the, when you look at pictures of the inside of power plants, you see the control rooms with people sitting at large desks with lots of buttons. One of those. Um, half the software stack consists of free software, and that was that let the development team cut the development time roughly in half. Why is this interesting? Because most managers, most product people will know that there are several, when you're developing a product, there are several things you can do in order to make your product pro more profitable. You can cut the development costs, that'll help a little. Um, you can invest a little in marketing, that'll help a little. That'll always, all these things bring a few percentage points. But we had, at Siemens, we found that when you reduce time to market substantially and you're first on the market, that uh, makes you like a third more pro or can make you like a third more profitable or something around those, something around that. Um, so reducing time to market is super important for people who release products. Um, and when free software lets them do that, they become really, really happy. So the free software community by now is probably our largest supplier of software. And we cannot afford to alienate that supplier. Um, plus, we don't want to. And we also cannot afford to not be able to ship product because uh, someone is complaining that we're infringing their license. Right? Um, so we've, there are a number of things we do at Siemens in order to make sure that everyone in this very large company sticks to the obligations from free software licenses. There are strict rules and procedures internally that say you have to stick to the licenses just in case you weren't sure about copyright law before, now you are. Um, and there are people in each business department that deals with software um, who are formally in charge of making this happen. Um, when we source software from supplier or source anything from suppliers that contains software, uh, boards, devices that go into our devices and so forth, um, we have standard clauses in the contract that say you have to give us the full compliance information, the source code, and everything that we need to 
give to our customers when we sell this product. Um, one could think about going a step further and actually insisting that the source code be handed to us before we pay for the delivery, uh, which would sometimes make sense. But we'll, anyway, so the supply chain for people in the industry is a perpetual headache. But this helps. Um, when you make rules, you also have to give people the means to put, those, uh, put your demands into practice. So Siemens um, invests in tooling. Uh, we're a major contributor to the Fosology license scanner. Anyone familiar with that? Ah, <laughs> but um, what it basically does is you, it's, it's a Linux, it started by HP, now it's at the Linux Foundation. Um, it's a tool you, that runs on a server, you upload a source code package like Vim or Emacs or Debian, uh, Debian something, which is, then turns into a bunch of packages, um, and it'll run a number of scans on the source code and tell you which file is under which license and who wrote what file and who holds the copyright, and all this. And you get a long, long, long list that makes extremely boring reading. Um, and you put that into uh, the, the compliance information that you ship with the, your product. Um, and of course, since you now know what licenses you have in the code, you also know the obligations, the compliance obligations that you have. Lots of bookkeeping. Um, and there's the Software 360 man software management application. I'll get to that in a minute. And finally, uh, all this is no good if people don't know how to actually use all these measures and why they're important. So Siemens has internally trained all people in software-related roles, more than 40,000 up to date, um, in the basics of free software and license compliance. Now, here's a small sample of the, C of the software, free software projects that Siemens um, engages with. On the right side, you'll see lots of stuff that is mostly focused on the embedded sector, besides the obvious things like Linux kernel, GitHub, we use that internally, um, C++ and so forth. But um, most of the devices that Siemens makes and sells are embedded devices, so which explains why everything is so focused on the embedded sector. And then there are a few projects uh, that we've initiated, I'm, I'm going to talk about those for a little now. Um, one is jailhouse which is a partitioning hypervisor based on Linux. What this means in practice is uh, you have a small, a small embedded computer and you want to run two operating systems on it. One that does nice things like the user interface and um, I don't know what, and the other that does the actual hard work like controlling that high-speed train. And this needs to be a real-time operating system operating in a very, in a very safety-oriented mode. Um, and they just run side by side on a, on, a tight, on a platform with very tight resources. So Jailhouse makes that possible. Um, then here's EMB Square, the embedded multi-core building blocks, uh, a C++ and C library for developing parallel app computing applications on embedded system. Again, real-time capable because um, we need this stuff to work on our actual products. Both are un available on GitHub. Jailhouse is GPLv2 because it's more or less in the kernel or in the kernel area. Um, and EMB square is two class BSD. Uh, Siemens doesn't really have preferences when it comes to licenses. It's just we'll use whatever, either, if we develop something ourselves, we'll just use whatever fits the usage scenario best. Um, and if, uh, we, if we take something from, that already exists, we of course stick to that license. Now, um, Regarding the compliance tools that we're building ourselves, uh, that we're using in addition to stuff like uh, the, the uh, proprietary black duck things and what everybody else uses in the industry, but um, this is, we have the Fosology license scanner that lets us generate the information we need for compliance. And then SW360 is something that Siemens started simply because when it comes to software, life in a corporation is very, very complicated. Um, software comes into the company in many ways, through many routes. People, someone buys products, someone buys proprietary licenses, uh, someone downloads stuff from the internet, um, someone, I don't know, lots of weird, lots of weird ways. Uh, then it gets handled, the software gets handled and processed and redeveloped and whatnot inside the company in many, many different ways. And then it gets shipped in many different ways. It gets put on CDs and given to people. It gets put on the software update download website of Siemens and downloaded from there. It goes through all sorts of distribution channels. 
Uh, and it can be a little complicated to keep track of all that. So, and there's no software on the market that currently does that. Um, so, so we're building it as a, uh, under the Eclipse public license on GitHub. Um, the software 360 is just designed to be a catalog, a database that stores information from the license scanner. It's optimized for phosology currently. Um, source code, like code quality checkers. Vulnerability management, very important. First, you need to know what, is, what software is in your product because when someone reports a vulnerability, you can't go running off like a headless chicken and checking 50,000 products, literally, on whether they contain a certain software component and if so, in what version. Um, you just need to know in advance. And um, so you can fix the vulnerability in the right places. So that is what we hope for, uh, Software 360 will deliver. Um, other companies have started working on this. Bosch has been contributing quite a bit. Um, but if anybody else feels like their company should also be joining this, you're absolutely welcome. Do I'm, either send us an email and say hello or just send a patch or, um, and we'll be really happy. And finally, the civil infrastructure, another interesting angle. Um, this was a collaborative or is a collaborative project that was announced in April this year. It's at the, hosted at the Linux Foundation. Um, Initiated by Toshiba, Hitachi, and Siemens, all three very big, very traditional industrial conglomerates. And um, they have a shared problem. Infrastructure, like rail, bridges, traffic systems, um, airport systems, increasingly consists of software and relies on software. Infrastructure also has extremely long lifetimes. 10 years is nothing. Design lifetimes of 30 years are pretty normal in that industry, and 50, 60 years are absolutely not unheard of. How are you planning to apply security patches to the current version of the Linux kernel 40 years from now? <laughs> Bit of a challenge there, um, and this project sets out to answer that. So they're building a, a long-term maintenance infrastructure for critical free software components, um, starting with the Linux kernel and starting with the three co with, with three companies and we hope very much that others will join because, well, it's a problem that many people have, many companies have, and it's fairly easy to solve with free software, at least easier than with all the other alternatives. Um, it's actually free software is the only possible solution here because how many software companies do you know that are even 30 years old, um, let alone 40 or 50, and how many of those will be around for another 30, 40, 50 years? And still support their product. <laughs> Good point. So um, these are some of the examples that I wanted to run you through of uh, stuff that I thought was cool that Siemens is doing. Finally, because I, I used to do advocacy at FSFE and I still do advocacy at Siemens, um, here are some arguments that we found work really well with our management. And maybe they work well with managers elsewhere too. One, I, one point I already explained, we need much more software than we can write. Remember the pyramids. It's just no company on this planet, at least not at that size, can conceivably or in a, in a, can conceivably, conceivably write all the software they need and expect to survive as a business. Um, you need free software or you're not going to be there in a few years from now. Then the super long-term maintenance argument that we, may, that, that we built the civil infrastructure platform to address um, with free software, you can actually perform super long-term maintenance over decades, and with, you can do this with no other type of software. One point that I wasn't aware of before coming to Siemens, um, and that surprised me a little, and I, for, that, for that reason, I really like it. At FSFE, I heard a lot of complaints. Oh, free software licenses, complicated, complicated, difficult, difficult. So many licenses, hundreds, all these variations, it's chaos. And then I talked to people internally uh, who, th these people in charge at the business units or in charge of compliance with third-party software licenses, both free and proprietary. And they go like, yeah, you know, free software licenses, piece of cake. Uh, we, you read them once, you know what's, you analyze them, you write down the obligations, and then every time you encounter that license, you take the list of obligations, paste it into your report, and hand that to the people who asked you for the report. And done. Um, <laughs> Five minutes, that much. And um, 
Proprietary licensing contracts, on the other hand, these, these things get negotiated by lawyers on both over the course of months um, between deciding that, you're gonna, that you want to use a piece of software and you actually getting it, months, if not years, will pass. Some of these contracts contain clauses that let the supplier update their terms of use for the software without telling you. So Siemens, whenever we decide to use the software, what does, that even, what, what does using the software mean in that context? Anyway, different question though, but still interesting. When we decide to use the software, we need to go every day and check what the current terms of use are. This is bullshit, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but it is. Um, instead, you have a GPL, a GPL v3 component. Hey, you might not be using that for a core product, but at least you know what you have to do. Um, and that is fine. Then the product people can decide whether they want to use that component or not, and you're done. So, um, and with free software, also you decide to use a piece of software in the morning and you have it by the afternoon and, or even earlier. Then uh, the other two are business arguments. When we contribute a little, we often get a lot back. Um, the Linux kernel currently has, sorry if I'm overworking that example, but it's just so convenient. Uh, the Linux kernel currently has about 21.4 million lines of code, of which Siemens, as of July 10 or so, had contributed 5,812. Um, <laughs> I haven't calculated the actual return on investment, but there's a, you can see a certain disconnect in the relationship. Uh, we're hoping to substantially raise that number at some point, but the fact for now is that all these products that I mentioned earlier that are running free software and other, uh, that are running Linux and many other free software components um, wouldn't really be possible in that form without all this. And we invested, we had someone write 6,000 lines of code. Oh, cost a little money, but how else could we have gotten all this software so cheaply to run our platforms? Um, and then there's the argument about pushing patches to mainline, um, pushing patches upstream working with the projects because um, it just you know it just makes you quicker it makes sure your requirements are accommodated um, when you when you start using the software or when when you need to use the software and not later um, and it just it just makes good business sense cuts time to market increases profit which is what of course at Siemens we all want right um, oh one point uh, before I finish if you ever look at software that Siemens distributed, not just own, but uh, also especially software that we distributed from someone else, and you find you stumble across something where you think it might be a compliance problem, and you conduct some proper analysis and still come to the conclusion that, the, that there might be a problem here, please write to this address. Um, it ends up with me and a few colleagues, and we'll, we'll promise to look into it. So, um, otherwise, we'll just, we're just always happy to hear from you, and um, we're there. We want to work together. Thank you. Do we have a couple of minutes for questions? Yeah, uh, just about uh, two minutes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll run over with the mic. Brevity is a virtue. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, you talked about strategic use, which meant, if I understand it correctly, uh, saving costs by using competitively not differentiating components. Um, when you think about strategic contribution or strategic leadership of open source projects, what business reasons for Siemens would you see to do that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, good question. It's actually something we've been working on, um, and I hope to... Sort of, you, you know how at what speed these corporations move. Glacial is a, it's a good description here, but um, we are very interested in very interested in getting people into in, in getting Siemens developers that are working on projects that are critical for us and very important for us into getting those into positions um, where they can really contribute to the project, like a maintainer position or. Um, even maybe even a project lead position. We don't want to take control of the project, not that. We just um, want to make sure that the project is develops in the best way it can. Yes? 
Um, so if a developer working for Siemens uh, wants to contribute upstream, do he need she he or she need approval or can can yes. can that be done? In, no, no, how no, does no. how's the process basically? Uh, do you happen to work for Siemens? <laughs> <laughs> Because I do get that question internally a lot. Uh, Siemens is a very diverse company. Things work differently in different places, just to explain this very briefly. Um, but the reference process we're, that we're setting up is basically the same that I use to get approval for these slides, for example, that any, someone would use to get approval for a journal article. Um, it goes, you submit it for approval. It goes through a few, to a few people, like the patent people, to make sure you're not distributing secret Siemens industrial knowledge. And um, the public, the publications people who make sure that you're not distributing total nonsense, and the stock market people who make sure that you're not tanking the Siemens stock. Um, um, at some point, it gets approved, and uh, at some point, it gets approved, and say, okay, you get, you can contribute now, or you can publish now. We do the same for source code. Um, and initially, we expect developers to ha get a sign off from, or to get permission from their team lead to contribute to a particular project. A particular bit of code. Uh, when they have a bit of a track record with that project, um, they get they might get permission to. Uh, let's say we're at version 0.3 with the project. They might get per permission to contribute up to version 0.5, and then we reassess. We go through the process again, and so forth. But um, it's not super lightweight, it's, but um, it actually works and it's reasonably quick. So I think we have to break there. Thank yeah. you very much, Carsten. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>